Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Leadership in Politics with Dr. Abraham. With me today is a special guest, Lauren Eckerman. Lauren, how are you? I'm all right, thank you very much. I said we'd check on you, find out how you're doing, what's happening out there with you. How's family, how's business, how's everything with you in Napa? Thank you. Well, as uh, many viewers will know, it's been a very interesting time in Napa this year, as it has been elsewhere as well. But we've been dealing with a lot of fires this year, um, not just one, but two, most recently last year. And me personally, I am um, fine. My vineyard is in the southern part of Napa, and it is um, further away from about 15, 20 miles away from where most of the current activity has been which is, by the way, still ongoing. Um, unfortunately, I do have a lot of winery friends who have not been as fortunate. And that way we are um, trying to you know, support them and help them in whatever way makes sense. But you know, for me, it's been an interesting year. Um, harvest would be normally taking place this year. And this year, unfortunately, because of the first fires that happened in mid-August, um, we will not be harvesting our grapes this year. And that's the first time that that has happened in 26 years. 26 years. I'm so sorry to hear that. Sorry for the, all the destructions happening. Now, you also have the Heritage House. And how are you doing there? The Heritage House, um, so that your viewers can understand, is you can see one of the rooms behind me here. Um, it is an 1888 Victorian um, mansion in downtown Napa that I purchased in 2010. And it took five years to restore it. And then we opened our doors to be a special, very unique um, hospitality in this event space. It, um, it serves also as a place for our wine tastings from um, my vineyard, which is only about 10 minutes away from the Victorian. Mm -hmm. and, and also does a lot of private events for various folks. And we've been still doing a few uh, small events and such, but larger events that we normally would do unfortunately this year because of COVID, have not been able to participate in that. So we're just doing minimal things where we can, mostly outdoors, mostly outside, or small groups inside um, as people are you know, able to do that. And it's been interesting times trying to, to keep both the winery business going when we have COVID restrictions still as well in Napa, um, and the Victorian itself, which is its own entity, you know, keep that going as well. So life has been very interesting this year. It's in very a lot interesting of this year, yeah, and, and COVID and what's happening. But you you really um, not only defied it, but you have, what is it, took you five to six years to put the Victorian house together? Yeah, five years. Five years. It was uh, very dilapidated. It was um, the appraiser that when I had to you know, look at it originally said if I hadn't bought it, it would probably have been condemned by the city in about mm. three to five years. It was that bad of shape, but the bones of it were beautiful. It, the interior, all the key pieces, 17 original stained glass windows were still there. They needed to be repaired, mm -hmm. but they were there. And all the original hardwoods and woodwork, you can see a little bit behind me what some of that looks like. This behind me is what we call the Grand Salon. And it's where we do a lot of receptions and things like that. But we also have you know, other parts of the house that were completely redone, including the kitchen. Because when I uh, purchased the house in 2010, the kitchen was still, believe it or not, in 1888 mode. It had the only thing built in in that kitchen was a sink and nothing else. There was no cabinets, no appliances, nothing. It was just a room with a sink and freestanding things that the previous owners had had. Yeah. Did you keep anything of the original design or you remodeled the yes. whole thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of what you see behind me is all original um, to it. The kitchen, unfortunately, would, is completely modern, but has the look and feel of this really kind of a cool Victorian era style, but, um, but definitely is for modern chefs. We have a lot of chefs that come through that do special cooking programs and we work with um, three former French laundry chefs mm -hmm. to do private events and private dinners or lunches or wine tastings and things like that. So it's been um, quite well received and I'm hoping that we can be open to everyone up here again soon. So that's so. my- Your brand is the Ackerman brand? Ackerman Family Ackerman. Vineyards and Ackerman Heritage House. Okay, and you also done uh, 
did you sponsor cruises or how did that happen that you also so we were asked by silver seas and michael mastercola this uh to do a special cruise this fall unfortunately that got canceled um for now or postponed um, we were going to be sailing uh, from uh, Barcelona, Spain to Venice, Italy, and um, serving wines and having our several of our wine club members were going to be joining us on that. So that was a special event. We hope to do that in the future. And I'm hoping that in um, either 2021 or 2022, that we'll be able to uh, put that back on the books for everyone to participate in. Are you one of the few female leaders that uh, work with uh, the wine industry or are there so many of you out there? Well, and that's, a, thank you for asking that. Um, it's a good question. I am, I think out of, you know, over 700 wineries, there's probably, it's a growing number, but I would say still only maybe 20% are female um, owners or businesses. Um, a lot of them, you know, might be taking a, a key role along with their partner or spouse. Um, in my case, I am running this by myself, and that is something that um, I've been doing for a while now, the winery um, side and making wine with my small team. So it is uh, interesting times, and um, I think, you know, more women, especially in the winemaking side, probably, um, and also in running and managing a winery business. There's a few more of us, but still not a, a number. Okay, now, you know what I, I noticed? Because I said, okay, let's have, let's check on you and find out how you're doing. But then I said, let me see the product you're providing. Mm -hmm. You added elegance to the product. It's not only we're providing a glass of wine or a bottle. You added elegance to it and you made it a brand by itself. Yes. Your, your, your brand is not just a grocery brand. Your, your brand is well-to-do brand yeah we're we're what we call um you know like the old model would have been kind of a collector model collector we are model. certainly we have wines that are in the what they call the super premium level <clears throat> which are over a hundred dollars a bottle but yes. we also have wines that are under a hundred dollars bottles so they you know they can appeal to um new wine enthusiasts or younger generation folks who are interested in wine but you know don't want to or can't afford to at this point to purchase those more expensive wines and that's primarily because I sit on a very small vineyard um, just under 16 acres um, 11 of which are planted I can only produce so much and um, and what I produce is you know um, very special Cabernet Sauvignon primarily um, or Cabernet blends and those just you know because of the labor they're all hand-picked hand handcrafted from beginning to end. Prices are a little bit different that way. And, and so you have a wine that's, you know, what we call that very elegant um, Bordeaux style, uh, wines that like to age well over time. And we've been making those wines since 1995. So it's been a long time. And so our reputation has grown over the years and we're in about 150 restaurants around the country. Hopefully those restaurants are still uh, going strong and, and different parts, but we've been growing it and we've been found by people over the, all over the country now. And we have representation in different states more and more now. So, but we're, so we're growing. It's been a long process, but it's been an exciting time. So basically slowly, but surely, but you're doing it the right way because your brand is there and it's, it has its own name and in place, yeah. but you haven't started with wine. You've done something else before having the winery and what, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who is Lauren? Uh, who am I? Well, um, I am, I was born and raised in Southern California and grew up um, near the water, near the beach. And um, I, I, think something like I grew up in, in Newport, Beach, Newport Beach and Laguna mm -hmm. Beach area. So, and um, spent a great time, you know, being a, 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 you know, a surfer girl and all those kind of things back in the day. Um, and then as I, when I graduated from college, which was my undergrads from USC and my graduate in strategic marketing and entrepreneurship is from Pepperdine University. Mm -hmm. I started my own um, technology business management consulting company for information top technology world. 
um, and did that, uh, helping work with about 75 different IT companies in setting up their uh, direct sales and or uh, retail sales, or uh, in one case, working with them on global database development. And all of those businesses and what I did in that area, really, as I came out of that in um, about 2000, I was done with that world, mm -hmm. started getting into philanthropy and uh, both local and national. And then about that time, the wine side of it had been slowly starting. So I was doing a few different projects side by side. And then over time, the wine business kind of took over. So I still tap into my technology background and um, still have a lot of friends that I work with or talk to in that area to keep relevant there. But, but my true passion is uh, definitely both in uh, the winemaking side and also in philanthropy. But basically, really, all of them, they're, they're very much applicable now, whether yeah. IT, serving others, or your business, because that's your bread and butter. Oh, I'm interested in this serving others part of it. Tell me a little bit, why would you like to serve others? Why do you spend your time, either waste your time or spend your time? <laughs> what do you think? Why I, do you do that? Um, I, you know, for me, when those early days when I got involved with it here in Napa, it was a way to actually really get to understand my community. In 1999, when I quit the IT and the consulting business in that world, I literally was here um, without really knowing anyone, even though I'd been here already five years, because previous to that, I was always on airplanes flying around and I didn't have time to get to know my own community in Napa. Mm -hmm. So when I volunteered on a, the first time on a school board um, and got involved and met some people, then I people kind of figured out I might have a little more knowledge than just literally licking envelopes. <laughs> and I was asked to be on a couple other boards. And in my um, heyday in one particular year, I think it was in 2001 or 2002, I was on seven boards, 22 committees and sharing 14, including a bank board. Um, I was a director of the local community bank as well as in six other nonprofits at the same time. So I literally got to know my community quite well in a very short order and who all the board directors and, and all the staff and everyone else in each of those institutions, you know, became, you know, very close friends in many cases. And I really got to understand what was making Napa tick in that nonprofit world. Because as a very small valley, we're only, what, 26 miles long, we have over 500 nonprofits in this area which is an enormous wow, amount. That's, of, that's, that's a large number. You, what do you attribute that to? I think it's just people, you know, here in Napa Valley, we're, um, we find that we're a very giving community. Okay. Uh, there was a study a long time ago when I worked on a thesis for the Rockefeller Foundation, which I am a graduate of, their uh, philanthropic workshop, that um, Napans in general give 8% of their income every year. And that was the average. Um, and that was pretty high compared to the rest of the Bay Area. I'm not sure what it is today, but at that time, that's what it was. And I think it's just um, our nature here in this valley. Um, people are always wanting to give back. There's a lot of people who made their wealth in other areas and they came to Napa to create something different with the wine business. And I think they feel um, very strongly that giving back at this point in their lives is a you know, very important feature or factor that they want to be able to do. And being in the wine business, we are always um, asked if there's a wine auction or some kind of, you know, event that needs to take place, we're always asked to give for those kinds of events, which we're happy to do in most cases. I can't do all of it all the time, but mm -hmm. I try to do that when I can. So something um, comes to mind, is this driven by a religious belief system to give back or... No, more not, like social justice. It's more just social um, responsibility. awareness and social awareness. charity and key causes. You know, we, um, we do a lot for um, uh, underprivileged families and children mm -hmm. and education. We do a lot for minority groups and such here as well, uh, especially since we have a very strong um, Hispanic and Latino community here in Northern California because of the farming and agricultural side of it. So we do a lot to provide housing and support um, for those communities wherever we can. Um, 
you know, a lot, uh, thank goodness, we have uh, with the Community Foundation of Napa Valley, that particular group, which I chaired for two years um, in the early 2000s, they've done a lot, and especially now with the fires, to do di disaster funding. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people um, fund for the earthquakes we've had in the past, or the flood we had in the past, and now, of course, the fires. So that's helping families get back up on their feet, or at least get them some kind of uh, ability to purchase, you know, immediate things that they need to have or their prescriptions or whatever it is. So we're able to do that. I think in general, people from all over the, you know, the United States and in some cases the world have come to Napa for a reason because it's beautiful. Um, and it is one of the premier wine areas in the world. And I think people just have the generosity spirit in, in them naturally. Nice. Um, and that's what I've seen to see over the years. That's very nice. Very nice. Now, are you still, uh, you're still part of the uh, nonprofit world in Napa? Yes. Okay. And how can people do to help, especially in this time of fires and what's happening? What yeah. can they do? Um, again, I think if you would go to um, the Napa Valley Community Foundation, uh, dot org, they are uh, set up an account for people to donate to, to help fire victims. And that I think is really important. I've donated as many other people have as well. I think that's really important. Um, the, the, fan, the nonprofits I'm personally involved with, I'm actually cut down to just three right now. Um, one of them is an organization based out of Santa Barbara called CSEE -E International. They are, um, for lack of you know, better terminology, they are sort of the doctors without borders for ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. They save people's sight all over the world and Very including nice. in the US. So that's a pretty amazing organization that I'm a director of. I'm also a member of the board for Festival Napa Valley, which is all about performing arts. Unfortunately, they could not do those performing arts this year because of the COVID, but a lot of what they do to raise money to, for performing arts goes to arts education in the schools, uh, which is sadly missing and I think very important for, for children to have access to. Um, and then the third organization I'm part of is the Culinary Institute of America, based in Hyde Park, New York, but they have two campuses here in Napa, at Greystone and also at Copia. And those are also all about education, um, not just for uh, teaching young people to be chefs, but also in food science, environmental um, science as it relates to growing food and safety in food and a number of other things on an international basis. So that's a pretty interesting organization as well. That's an amazing uh, line of uh, organizations that you're with. And you said only three, one would be enough. Amazing. <laughs> uh, one would be enough. There's yeah. really something else. Thank you. So yeah, people have said that. I'm, I, I enjoy being part of these things. I enjoy Where does making... your passion? Where does your passion come from? Because you're not just giving back. Uh, there must be something else in you uh, that drives you. Where does that come from? I think just to make, you know, for me, I think since I was very young, I always wanted a, pe a chance with, if I was able to provide it in my you know, later years to be able to help people be the best that they can be, to be um, able to be leaders themselves, to, to be a mentor to folks that wanted, you know, how do, how do I, you know, I've had many people say, how do I become successful? How do I become, um, you know, be able to not only provide for my family, but provide for my neighbors or, you know, what people do you with tell them? Around. What do you tell so them? I tell them, you know, first of all, get a great education, mm -hmm. do whatever you can to do that. And let me ask you something there. Is that sure. prerequisite? Is the education prerequisite or they can have no education or minimal education and still help others? Is education yeah, I, prerequisite? I think education in my world always helps as much as you can get, as much as you can. But certainly if you have a passion and want to give back, you can be a volunteer at any level for anything mm -hmm. that is a passion that you might have, be whatever it is. It doesn't mean that you have to have that. It just means that it does help, I think, in terms of how to be more strategic about what your efforts are doing. And that you, really you have the know-how, you have the know-how what to do. Right, exactly. Okay, what, what's next? And I think, you know, just essentially, um, yeah, as I mentioned, getting involved with something that is truly um, 
interesting to you personally in, in that field, whatever that might be, whether it's um, helping young families, whether it's, uh, you know, different minority groups, whether it's uh, putting food on the table for families, um, you know, whatever it is, find that passion, find out where you want to help the most and then just volunteer and be part of it. And I think that is the best reward is giving that. Yeah, put your time and effort to it. That's something That's right. else. That's something else. Thank you for sharing that. What else do you want to tell us? What else do you want to share about yourself or what you do? Well, I think the thing is for me now, having been in this field for a while and still here and even in a very difficult year, you know, just being positive, um, looking forward. I always look, you know, five, ten years out. I plan for you know, what's to come and I give myself leeway on being flexible in those plans. Mm -hmm. But, you know, certainly this year with losing crop to smoke taint, unfortunately, and, you know, COVID not helping and, you know, recent fires and all these things, in spite of all of that, it's still very much a, uh, for me, I look forward to, okay, so this year's a wash, what are we going to do? How do we get back out there? How do we do, and what are the opportunities and a and um, points that you can pivot to do new things that you know takes you further down that road. That's what's been interesting for me personally, because in the wine business, who knew that we would be shut down like we are? So we've been doing things like virtual tastings and different kinds of events that bring people to us. And it's not just me, the whole Valley, and I'm sure a lot of other businesses have been doing things. And I think that's important to always keep looking at when one door closes, what are the doors that open? What Go look for those new doors. And they are there. They just might take a little searching, but they are definitely there. I like the point. So you, you said it took about 26 years for this thing to happen. You never, you, you never experienced it. It's not like you no. said, oh, this, is, this, this thing happened uh, five years ago. No, you said 26 years. And based on your experience, you really don't have 26 years in the wine business, but you have 26 years as a, as a leader. Right. So what I'm interested in, why or how did you realize there is always tomorrow? Let me, let me rephrase it. Mm -hmm. You didn't, I don't want to use the term cry, because some people say, well, look, dwell on the past and say, look what happened to us and stuff. You didn't say that. You mm -hmm. said, there is always tomorrow. You are an opt optimist and you're looking for new opportunities. Right. And you're saying there are. They do Absolutely. exist. Tell me how. Why did you say that? How did you formulate that, that mindset so others can learn from it? You know, that's a good, good question. I, I think it's something that is inherent in me from a very young age. Um, and I think for me, over time and you know, just living life and being in business and, and being here, I've learned through experience that every time you think it's at its absolute worst, and there's been some pretty terrible times in our history last you know, several decades and such. Yes, we have to get through those. We, we have a choice. We can either let those things take us down and let those things um, immobilize us, or we can say, what can we do about it right now? And what can we do going to move forward and take those steps, however hard they may be, and move forward. And I think for me, I learned over years of experience now to say the best thing to do is you can always mourn the past or, you know, have a moment. I give myself a day, <laughs> literally a day or that's maybe it. two. A day and that's it. Then you move on. That's right. You, you I give myself a, a pity party day for one day. And I just mm -hmm. say, okay. And then I kind of go, okay, what are you going to do next? How what are, are you going to solve? How are you going to move forward? And I then sit and brainstorm or look through it and just let whatever ideas flow, write them down. Some of them obviously are not the right ideas, but they might spawn something that is. And that's how I always am kind of looking at, how about this? Why don't we try this? Or let's do this. I run that by my team. We have, you know, we have brainstorming sessions together and then we come down to plan that we think we can execute and then we execute. And that's really, you know, how I get myself out of those situations and look forward, you know, and, and know that this is temporary. I think that's part of it. This is 
everything we're experiencing right now, it may have long lasting effects, but there's opportunities in that. And these things tend to be temporary. They tend to be temporary because they are temporary. That's and right. We always have mm -hmm. to look forward. I like the optimism um, aspect of it. And uh, there's always tomorrow. Yes. There's always a better tomorrow. And you, my dear friend, you will overcome what you're going through now. And people in Thank the NAPA will, will overcome that. Tell me, I, where can the people find you two weeks from now, one, one month from now, whenever they're visiting NAPA, where can they find you? Call us at 855-AFV-WINE. Um, that's the phone number for the Victorian behind me. And I think, um, you know, I'm available to chat or talk or set appointments up if people want to stop by or, or come visit What's or have website? a glass of wine. What's the website? The website is yeah. www.ackermanfamilyvineyards.com. Excellent. You should be proud yes. of yourself. You should be proud of what you achieved. I'm honored to know you. It's a pleasure to meet you and bring your insight to the audience. Thank you for doing Likewise. this. Likewise, wonderful to meet you as well. And thank you for this opportunity to be part of this. And I look forward to a future, maybe check in or something and see how we all do getting Without through all. So, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.